Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? My name is Eric, and here to explain his own past is Michael Kester. Yeah, you may also introduce me as confused today. The uh, very confused Michael Kester. <laughs> uh, on, th- on this show, and this is how we often like to start the show. Confused. I would say confused and extremely excited. Is yeah, that, that's, I mean, that is I know you're much, a little more confused, and I'm a little more excited. That's how I start every day. Usually, you're a little more excited, and I'm a little more yeah. confused. That's yeah. typically well, how this, this goes. Yeah, this, but this is, it's because we're hitting noir, and that's, uh, that's your land, not right. my land. We have a questionable past double feature. Right. Where, uh, Not finding us out, personally. No, our past is well documented over the last four years. Huh. Some might say painfully documented over the last four years. What are the, the two movies? We're going to do a history of violence and out of the past. We certainly are, and there are going to be spoilers. Mm-hmm. We're going to try hard to spoil the films. Yeah, we're going to make sure that they're thoroughly spoiled. A history of violence we're just going to ruin. So don't don't listen to that if you... It might actually be a good idea to listen to our show about Out of the Past to see if you can understand what the fuck right. is going on afterwards. We might be a good digest yeah, for Out of the right. Past. But you know what? Definitely don't do that for a history of violence. Yeah, that's see a, bad a history idea. of violence. I'm going to go to bat for this film. Oh I think my God. it's a fucking great film. It, does it need somebody to go to bat no, for it? No, it really doesn't. Oh, okay. But I'm going to do it anyways. All right. And uh, it's Cronenberg. And if you listen to the show, you're probably interested in it. Mm-hmm. Just go watch it. If uh, you haven't seen it yet, you just want to go right into Out of the Past, you're a big noir geek, you just skip right to that, and we are gonna, we're going to talk about some different noir stuff, mm-hmm. totally separate than what we usually talk about on the noir shows uh, with Out of the Past. So there's spoilers, there's chapters, use the chapters, skip the spoilers, and uh, we begin with the first movie. For all the powerful things happening in A History of Violence, somehow, and I almost feel like a bad person for this... <laughs> I remember the long car scene in the very beginning. I don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah, so the two guys, one of which is uh, the oh, gentleman from Pawnee Stephen Stephen McCaddy. Right. Um, they're hanging out in the car, and right. they're, they're leaving their hotel or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they're having a, it's a long take outside, the sound of the bugs, right. it's very, very loud. Credits are... Credits are happening. There's a lot of very distinct things going on in uh-huh. the scene. And you're studying it. It's the first look you're getting into this film. You're trying to figure it out. And uh, it's just a it's a gorgeous, brutal little scene. And it means nothing. It, it Yeah, really, it means nothing. We're learning about two human beings who will be executed. Yeah. Sorry, I should really support the protagonist a lot more here. <laughs> he did it in defense. Well, what, totally okay. Yeah, I mean, essentially what's happening is we're gaining insight into the people that are going to cause this uh they're gonna unravel another yeah. human being's life that's essentially what's gonna happen is we get and they're fucking hot shots too yeah they that drove me are. crazy yeah i will get to it when we get to it now let's get to it right now okay it drove me nuts these guys Stephen mccaddy and also another actor from shoot 'em up i don't know the actor's name oh bad form but they walk into this diner after hours i love the diner i love all diners of course you do but we get these two assholes who walk in at closing time which is already not cool sure you don't do that that's that's just mean these guys walk in demand coffee and pie which is lame and hey don't knock coffee and pie i'm not knocking right? coffee and pie i'm knocking coffee and pie after hours okay all right i'm, I'm still if with you if you're going in after hours order a meal pay them yeah right you know what i mean mm-hmm. and so they go in and they kind of start trouble they lock the door say shit's about to go down and Tom says very calmly, very civilly, in the most rational voice of any human being in mm-hmm. this film, listen, we don't have a lot of money in the register, but whatever we have, you are certainly welcome to it. Right. Just please don't hurt anybody. Right. To which the guy says, yeah, you're damn right I'm welcome to it. <laughs> sure. He pulls out a gun and says, now you're going to do what I say. Yeah. Could have just left. Could have been a nice guy and yeah. just taken off with the money. Yeah, but instead they're fucking hotshot criminals. Yeah, no, not good enough for him. And I mean, I feel really bad for, well, Joey, who's Tom at yeah. this point, right? Uh, because like you say, he's not doing anything wrong. He's clearly the victim in this situation. 
And I mean, uh, I should point out pacifists talking about violence yeah. today. Uh huh. Two pacifists, perhaps, Absolutely. talking about violence. Yeah, but I, I will definitely say that I like watching my share of gore on the old uh, on the old cinema. That's going to be a surprise to regular listeners. Here is the best fucking thing. There's about twelve best fucking things about this movie. I'm uh-huh. going to get to best fucking thing number one. There's one best fucking thing for every cross in the next film. Double cross in Out of the Past. Best fucking thing in the history of violence. So the first one, I suppose, is that he is incredibly convincing in his cover. Yeah. He is so convincing oh, yeah. in his cover that I believe him. Yeah, so do I. I believe him after I see him fucking karate chop and flip over a counter. Right. And I still am thinking, wow, that was a really lucky. Yeah. He just seems to snap. He does this thing. And then he just goes right back to being a normal guy. Right. He explains it away as, a, what? what's he say? Something that any normal person would do in that situation. Sure. And I don't even evaluate, but could a normal person do this? Yeah. I just think, oh, yeah. Yeah. You know what? An upstanding citizen. He, yeah, right. It came down to violence, and he defended himself and his coworkers. Now, in being convinced by his cover, I mean, we've seen this with Cronenberg uh, movies on the show before, but this is definitely different here. Mm-hmm. I don't even know what to believe, but I mean, the movie is called A History of Violence. Right. It pretty much tells you in the it title, does. doesn't it? It, it? Well, but it could also be misleading you. Into, okay, that's Because true. the next step in the film, right, the next beat is when uh, Ed Harris's character, the man with the eye, sure. or lack thereof, uh, comes in and starts accusing Tom Stahl of being Joey Cusack. Right. And that's the point where a history of violence could just be a misnomer. Yeah. Right. Joey Cusack has a history of violence sure. that Tom Stahl is actually not a part of. You think we're dealing with the wrong man. Again. Sure. Yeah. And so eventually I'm just as in denial as he is. And that's, I mean, that's a credit to the actor. It's a credit sure. to the story. Huge credit to the actor. You know, his reactions to everything. I uh, just seem honestly confused, very seriously confused. You have me mixed up with somebody else. I completely buy it to the point that when Edie eventually finds out when uh-huh. he kind of comes clean, she goes and she vomits and it's uh, this amazing thing. I mean, I feel in the exact same place she is in. Yeah. I feel literally sick to my stomach. Like I've been betrayed with uh, this guy who I thought I knew so well since right. I've spent sure. 40 minutes in the film with him. Right before Jack blasts the hell out of Fogarty, sure. we get this moment where Tom says, or I guess Joey says, I should have killed you in Philly right. when I had the chance, or yeah. something along those lines. Sure. That's the first time he breaks character, yeah. if you will. The first time, I guess, depending on how you look at it, either the first time he breaks character or the first time Joey reemerges yeah, sure. from Tom. Yeah, and I guess I should feel the betrayal more in that moment. But it's but more I'm confusing so and heated yeah. and violent. Yeah, but you're right. That really is the reveal in that scene. I'm caught up in the violence, but that is the moment where as an audience member, we're really shedding light on this. It's betraying that cover for the first time. Right. And I love how subtly they deal with the sort of uh, what Edie is concerned with and what the audience may be concerned with as well as multiple personalities. Right. Because that's the first time where I question what the film's doing. Mm -hmm. The movie is perfect up to that point. And that's where, uh, you know, when you're watching a great movie, you're waiting for it to derail itself. Sure, that's what happens. saying, "Uh uh-oh, multiple personalities. The longer a film is great, the harder you expect it to fail. (laughs) Precisely. But I, I don't know what's going on here. Somehow, multiple personalities, they deal with it in a way that is so ambiguous, it is perfect. It's well, genuine and it's perfect. I guess it's, it's what, manual multiple personalities? It's, it's, it's this self-extinction of yourself and then sure. recreating a character that was available. Well, you know, they talk about it in the film that he's been uh, lying to himself for so long, it seems as if he actually believes it. Right. And he explains it right away as, you know, I spent three years in the desert essentially i guess practicing this character trying yeah. to make himself into this killing other person, joey right killing getting, joey and- getting uh getting rid of this other life and so i think it's a fairly realistic take on multiple personalities sure well i think that it's i think that it's uh kind of again i think that's one of those things that it's not really what it is because sure. if you imagine it you have to kind of walk backwards through it see it seems a little confusing when you have Tom Stahl at one end mm. and Joey Cusack at the other. 
Sure. But what you have to acknowledge is the fact that Joey Cusack at some point decided to become Tom Stahl. Right. There's an evolution right. there where Joey always had this good side sure. that he must have been battling with. Right. And eventually made the conscious decision that he was no longer going to be a ruthless psycho killer. And so you're not talking about multiple personalities in the sense that you'd normally be, you know, doing this. Right. It's really just a person he used to be. And uh, this cover is kind of the person he's become. Mm -hmm. There's the old version of him. There's the new version of him. And we're really just explaining, you know, his his suppression of his crazy violent skills. Sure. I mean, that's... Skills. Well, you know, that he has the ability to do to disarm an entire room of sure. people. Dance around gunfire and yeah. snap a man's neck. Where did that come from? Oh, it came from this past life. So this is just a man who's abandoned his past life. And there's nothing really, uh, there's no suspension of disbelief right. there. No. I think that's, uh, that's a premise that's very easy to swallow. So that was a huge relief for me in the way that the film tackled that. Sure. Managing to take, oh, what is this, like some multiple personality thing? Uh -huh. And then backed away a little bit and said, no, it's actually kind of like this, and it makes a lot right. more sense than that. And Edie's reaction to it is great. And, you know, I think Edie's an amazing character. She's the, uh, in this family unit here, she's definitely... The breadwinner. She's uh -huh. the person with the, uh, you know, the complicated job that probably sure. brings all the money home. Right. But she's still able to be compassionate. Yeah. Um, both with her kids and definitely with her husband. You know, you believe that these are all very real people who care a lot about each other. Right, and they're really trying to make their lives work. Yeah, exactly. They're invested in what each other are doing in their day. They're, uh, you know, this is a loving mother. This isn't just somebody who... You know, she's the nine to five and he's the stay at home dad or something yeah, like that. Right. I mean, they're both working parents, but you see that compassion, especially in some of her stronger moments in that moment where she tells off Fogarty. Right. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem like if you just saw that scene and you were trying to look into that character a bit, that seems like somebody who's protective, but might not be able to ever let her guard down right. or be compassionate with somebody. Yeah. And uh, and that's not her. She's just fierce. You know, she takes the initiative in lying to Sam. That's the moment where she decides, I'm going to back my husband and mm -hmm. this is what we're going to do. She doesn't even consult with him. She just makes that decision. She's in charge at that point. So she has this incredible ability to look fierce and to look fierce next to Joey, yeah. which is amazing because he is our crazy assassin guy. Right. Now, this movie's come up on our show a couple times before. Yeah. And I think usually when it comes up, it's as an example of a movie where the brutality seems amazing. Yeah. It seems to hit pretty hard. Well, and I think a lot of that comes from the fact that the majority of the film isn't high octane, high action. You know, there's not a lot of violence going on right. except for these kind of snaps and outbursts and sure. the dynamic range of what goes on in a scene just changes so drastically. And it seems like, because it's David Cronenberg, it seems like the violence is done in a an over-the-top way, mm -hmm. you know, kind of akin to something like The Expendables, yeah. where it seems like the violence is stylized and it's supposed to make you say, oh my God, did he just do that? Right. But that juxtaposed against a normal human story sure. makes it seem so much more intense. It absolutely does. It's uh, the stuff we've been exploring constantly with Cronenberg, especially in the, the scanners kind of period yeah. or, you know, just seeing a comic book violence and then bringing that back into reality. These are all uh, gory moments that you may see in the worst parts of a real person's life. Sure. This is uh, this is nothing, you know, it's not an, a telepathic exploding head, right? Yeah, it's not that. But it's somehow a level of gore that almost feels worse because yeah. of how rooted and as if you get into these struggles yourself and end up taking a person's life, it might not look as clean as a bullet sure. to the head. It might look like, you know, when you triple break somebody's yeah. nose. Or you stomp on their throat. And so there's these tension-filled scenes where the normal scenes are... Uh, completely muted, and then you get this sort of um, ominous kind of sense of foreboding. Something mm -hmm. is that these men walk into this coffee shop. Something very bad is going to happen. And the trick here seems to be to make that bad thing abrupt and intense. So, you know, this happens on a grand scale. It happens on a small scale. Think of the coffee shop, right? So this guy, uh, you know, pulls the woman to the side, 
you feel things are heating up. It's mm-hmm. going at a very exponential rate. And we just, you know, we end that exponential curve. We smash a guy in the face with a boiling coffee pot. We only have a second to think about it. It makes you understand that this is a split second decision Mm -hmm. and it just happens and you're caught off guard by it. It's completely shocking. But there's these slow moments of tension building too. things uh, like when he goes to the mansion Mm -hmm. toward the end of the film uh, and the door to the mansion is slowly seen shutting. You know, it's that ceiling in the fate uh, kind of moment. Right. You know, he's stuck in there now. And then the camera is going to travel in the mansion. We're not going to get out of the mansion for a while. The type of scene that tells you just in a brief moment that this may be the last fucking door our character walks through. Right. And so now we're on edge, you know, the entire time. We've built that tension by just showing a door shut slowly. There's a couple other interesting techniques that Cronenberg uses here that I haven't seen in a lot of his other movies. And I wonder if they feed into the tension or if they're stylistic. The biggest one I notice is the the camera, how the camera will start high in scenes and then work its way back down to kind of an eye level. Mm -hmm. And it's not always a scene that needs to put you on edge. Sometimes it's Jack playing baseball, right? Something as simple as that. Although that does become a a point of conflict as well. Sure. It's still something that as I rewatch this film, I puzzle over a little bit, and it might just be stylistic, but there are moments where, you know, that brings tension as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, When Edie pulls into the shopping place and she's getting out of her car and stuff, and it's showing the, it's almost an overhead, uh, direct overhead camera shot of her parking and getting out. The camera kind of comes back around, it lowers itself to eye level, and then Fogarty's car pulls directly up into it. Right. So we get this very safe bird's eye perspective, and we end that same fluid shot with a car pulling right up to our faces. So we've been completely disarmed, and now something as simple as a car pulling up is invading our own, you know, our own comfortable space. Mm -hmm. Another one that he uses, and it's in different moments throughout the film, is uh, I can't remember if we've ever talked about the rule of thirds in cinematography. Probably a while ago. So it's just kind of a basic rule, and we talked about it on, I think it was Silence of the Lambs, Mm -hmm. right? Because I was talking about how Hannibal Lecter is always centered in the frame and how it's off-putting because you expect things in the thirds of the Mm -hmm. frame. So when you're lining up a photo, when you're lining up a shot, very commonly you can divide your frame into thirds. You can put the subject in that division between the, you know, the first and second or the second and third. And it's just an aesthetically pleasing, you know, way to position your subject. Uh Usually when you are shooting widescreen and you're shooting two people talking to each other, you'll have one person in the rightmost third staring all the way over to the left. And then you'll cut to the other person. They're in the leftmost third. They're staring all the way to the right. It's really hard to explain this without a visual. But you know what? You can look up rule of thirds or there's perfect examples in basically anything you ever watch. Just look for it next time you know, you're know you watching something. Now, what you'll usually do in the composition of that is you will have your, your actor looking into the open part of those thirds. Mm-hmm. They'll be all the way to the right and they'll be looking at this two thirds of empty space over to the left or vice versa here we have this slightly more uncomfortable positioning where cronenberg will put somebody into let's say the first third of the frame and have them staring off into the smaller portion of the screen onto the left hand side rather than looking towards the open space giving us a little room to breathe these characters will be talking it'll give us the illusion that they're uh, they're a lot closer to each other. Mm-hmm. And just by betraying you know, a standard, it makes the audience feel uncomfortable without knowing they're feeling yeah. uncomfortable. And I feel like anytime you do anything outside of the rule of thirds, you know, that's the exact same thing in Silence of the Lambs. Right. You center Hannibal Lecter, the audience feels uncomfortable, they don't know why they're feeling uncomfortable. <laughs> you have the person in the rule of thirds talking to the slimmer part of the screen, they have all this expansive area behind them they're not using, right. suddenly you feel a little more uncomfortable. There's a perfect example of it, if you go back through the movie and you look at where uh, he's talking to his brother towards the end, just walked into the mansion, they're sitting down, they're talking to each other, you know, that's one of the few areas in the, in the film where this is used very effectively. So we've talked a lot about the brutal moments that Joey has, you know, cracking a coffee pot into someone's head and their face parts melting out all over the man. When that guy hits the floor, <laughs> it just his face looks terrifying. And the violence is fast and it hits hard. But that happens outside of the scenes 
with just Joey, even when you're dealing with uh, like that violent moment at the school, right? Where Jack punches out Bobby, mm-hmm. it feels like one of those. This is a long time coming. Right. Smacks him in the face and just goes ballistic on the guy and leaves him. I mean, it, it looks like the kid needs to be hospitalized right. immediately, and he probably does. The one on the lawn is one of the best ones too, where everybody is kind of awkwardly standing in front of the house. And, you know, he breaks the guy's nose by repeatedly punching him into it. It's one of those things we talked about on the second Halloween, where one punch will probably knock the guy out of commission. Sure. Two or three punches feels brutal. We are making sure this man will never smell again. And it's almost to the point where you're sitting there going, how many times can he hit this guy before the other guys are going to do anything about it? Yeah. I'm sitting there going... Why aren't you shooting at him? Right. Look what he's doing to that guy's face. Yeah, that's definitely part of the style. It's always one or two more punches that yeah. you think our character can possibly get away with. Right. But think about it, man. That accomplishes two things. Feels more brutal, but also more tension. Yeah, it feels like exactly. any second they will shoot him. They should have shot him one punch ago. He's really pushing his luck. Yeah. He needs to get moving. There's a lot of moments throughout the film where you think uh, just in that instant that this is it for him. He's done. I mean, even when he's on the grass in that lawn scene, Mm -hmm. you know, it's a different mechanic, but they're still making you think, all right, this guy's standing over him. He has a gun to his face. In my head, I'm going, all right, he's probably going to drag him back to Philadelphia or whatever. But he says, all right, I'm going to execute you here and now. Do you have anything else to say? Of course, because you have to ask that. Right. And Jack fucking shoots the guy. Another, you know, brutal moment. He falls to the ground, saves him in that last instant. My favorite one, though, and just as I remember the car scene all the time in the beginning for whatever stupid reason, I remember this mansion scene, and I feel good about remembering the mansion scene because it's fantastic. This is, uh, you know, I'm thinking of the scene in particular. The whole mansion scene reminds me of the darkness, reminds me of the end of the darkness. But uh, I'm thinking particularly he's in that room, and the guys are standing behind him. You could see them right out of focus, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of getting ready. You don't know what that guy's fucking with. You're thinking, where's the gun? He's clearly got something in his hand. It's a wire, which you can't see out of focus. Awesome. Totally great. (laughs) Don't even know what weapon he's going to come and kill him with till he gets close enough. And there's no possible way he's getting out of this. There are three people in the room, two of which are behind him. One is across a desk. But he somehow fucking ninjas out, kills two of the guys. Another guy comes in, snaps his neck, steals his gun, or uses it to shoot his way out, right? I think he just runs out. No, you're right. He doesn't even use the gun. Yeah. He just runs out. He doesn't run out. He skips out. Yeah. He just kind of gently, whoop, and there, I made it. But the best fucking part of that scene is William Hurt's yeah. stupefied outrage. <laughs> he cannot believe, you know, he's mirroring the audience. He again. puts his hands up and goes, well, how do you, how does that happen? <laughs> right. What the fuck, How guys? do you fuck that up? Yeah. Of all the times we've discussed William Hurt on the show, whether it's um, Altered States or Dark City... I mean, just his reactions in that moment, for as much of a small part as he has, Yeah, I feel like this is maybe where I have this strange love of William Hurt. Sure, I could totally see that. I've always had trouble pinning it down, but mm-hmm. I think I saw a history of violence first and then sought out his other movies. Didn't realize at the time he was in Dark City, you know, way back when I saw this. But just his little, you know, Cronenberg says, all right, we need a guy at the end who can fucking bring it, who can be the, you know, the boss man. Mm -hmm. Not the guy who walks into a diner pretending he's the boss man, but the actual boss man, the one who sits in the recliner letting someone else do the dirty work. And you bring in William Hurt, and he has about three things to do in the entire film, and they're all outstanding. So I know a couple times on our other Cronenberg conversations... Uh, maybe when we did the the whole show around him, Scanners and... Mm-hmm. Um, Eastern Promises. Eastern Promises, right. That I mentioned in particular, part of his work was very sexual in nature, yeah. and that we didn't really see it a lot in those particular shows, right. but that it would come up in other stuff. We've somehow avoided it really in The Fly and in Naked Lunch, and this is a movie where that is uh, completely on display. I mean, that's sort of, I I think of a word like psychosexual Mm -hmm. to describe how Cronenberg treats sex in his movies. So we have this this take on, and I know I mentioned Crash, not the award lowest common denominator Crash, but the awesome, weird, sexual David Cronenberg Crash when trying to cite something that would come up with that kind of dark... I guess unconventional sexuality, Mm -hmm. but here is just as perfect of an example Um, in, you know, the relationship that Edie shares with Joey, with Tom, 
And this is one of those things that may be really off-putting if you've never seen a Cronenberg movie before, you're not prepared for, you know, what's about to happen because of how unconventional it is. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't seem like, you know, the whole time we're supposed to feel that Tom's a great guy, and then these sexual encounters seem weird, like there's something right. bad about him that isn't, you know, American Pie like everything else is. Mm -hmm. So really, there's two. Um, both equally important, I think. The The first one is the Go Wildcats one. Yeah. You know, where um, she says, my parents are in the next room. She dresses up in the weird cheerleader thing. Right. And it's, you know, it's parents, people who are the age of parents, people who are actually parents, uh, have, you know, a kid in high school and another daughter wanting to have sex again as if they were kids. Mm -hmm. And so there's something inherently just in explaining that that seems a little creepy. But the music makes it seem... I mean, the music is heartwarming, and the score throughout this entire movie doesn't feel like what we've heard in these other Cronenberg movies. Right. It's a very heartwarming score. But as the sex gets more explicit, the heartwarming score doesn't match up with, <laughs> it's no longer, oh, they're trying to rekindle their you know, juvenile love, which also tells us about their past, right? She's saying that thing we, we could never mm -hmm. do. We never really had love as teenagers. And then it gets more explicit, and it goes from heartwarming to disturbing. But I think that sex is probably more real than a lot of the sex we see in movies. This over-romanticized kind of, uh, you know, this idea that when sex is planned, it's planned on a bed of fucking rose petals. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Right. There's wine and champagne and, I don't know, Barry White or whatever yeah. the sexual cliche for the last <laughs> decade. You know what I mean, though? Yeah, totally. It's always warm and soft. Or that or it's fast and hard. Mm -hmm. It's one of the two things. And so we see how Cronenberg does it warm and soft, and we see how he does it fast and hard. Yep. And so I love that we get that more realistic portrayal, although for these characters, that happens to be a little bit darker portrayal. But that makes them really human, too. Mm -hmm. Or at least the first one does. The second one is where he attacks Edie on the steps. Right. And this is, for all of the, the violence that we've been talking about, this is still one of the most uncomfortable scenes for me. I remember, you know, we were talking about, I think it was Gorgor Girls. And we were talking about how, you know, we're, we're seeing nudity in all these movies. We right. wouldn't know how much nudity we would actually see in Double uh -huh. Feature this year. And how that nudity felt really safe. And sometimes when a, a movie does it really well, it doesn't feel, it actually feels disturbing even when you and I are just watching it for the show. Right. And no one's even aware we're, yeah. we're locked away in the studio watching <laughs> this and it's not, no one's going to judge us. But this is one of those scenes where I, I feel uncomfortable every time yeah. I see it because it feels wrong. Something about he's almost raping his well, wife. It, I, feel, I feel like it feels like she's cheating on Tom with Joey. <laughs> sure. That's the well, vibe that I got. Yeah, is there's this that weird too. she's sticking it to Tom by fucking Joey thing. But when I say psychosexual, I mean, this is a perfect example. This is uh, sex not just for pure enjoyment in, uh, in their lives or really a step back in the movie. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to learn something from you know from this encounter this is something where i mean after you know just giving all of that news he's desperate to be close to her right. again, and it's in that really emotional place that he's losing control that he's slipping from one of those characters into the other all of that uh time he fucking spent in the desert is just it's gone wasted but that's also a telling scene for Edie because she wants him to be familiar after hearing all of this right. stuff, and that's probably why she gives into it sure you know, she wants to be close to her husband in a way where she can't, you know, she can't be intellectually close to him at this uh -huh. point. So maybe by giving in sexually, that's, yeah. you know, that's the only hope she has. Right. Something she actually can understand. And she's ashamed afterwards. You know, she's resentful to mm -hmm. him and she's ashamed. So Cronenberg somehow manages to make this movie that has some of the most brutal violence I've ever seen. And as a pacifist, I feel almost like the movie's made for me. Yeah. There's a scene where Jack's getting bullied in school. He has such a perfect reaction to that aggression. You know, he says, oh, yeah, you're obviously a huge badass. Everyone's impressed. You know, mm -hmm. kicking my ass won't improve that. It's going to frame the rest of, right. you know, the film for us. Sure. We see a guy who's put in a situation where he's tried to get away from that violence and he's pulled back into that. Yep. And the movie doesn't just use the heartfelt stuff for manipulation. You know, it ends on that somber dinner scene. It has, you know, his little girl goes and gets the plate for him. It's just, mm -hmm. it's really bittersweet. It proves that the movie has a purpose and really some kind of soul in what it's doing. And do you hear that beautiful sound? 
it's almost like the construction has stopped. <laughs> I don't know if that police siren outside has chased the construction away. <laughs> so we did this one old school today. We're talking about out of the past. Where uh, we took a little break because it was way too fucking noisy yep. to record the show. And as you know, audio quality is the only thing I think we can do right. And uh-huh. so when we can't even get that accomplished, right. we're in trouble. Uh, we took a break. We watched, we watched another movie that had nothing to do with today's show because we just needed to kill two hours. And now we have returned here in Double Feature. Yeah. And we have some sort of film noir something. This is a really interesting setup for a movie because we're introduced to uh, the shady man first. And, you know, he comes into town and heads into a diner looking for a man without a past. It's a remarkably unique storyline we've never seen anywhere else. Right, not at all. He's looking for the mysterious Jeff Bailey. Who works across the street at what I assume is a gas station, a fill-in station, with a deaf kid. And so we already have some strange characters here. Uh, but when we're introduced to our male lead, mm-hmm. he's, you know, he starts coming clean with his girlfriend right away. Right. Which is something kind of unusual for this, this uh, man with no past type of story. And you might wonder right away, well, where's the mystery in that? Where is the, where's the romantic Batman angle? You know okay. what I mean? That is, Who is, yeah, that's always my question in a film. Where is where's the romantic, the romantic Batman? Batman angle? I could have made a battering joke. Would you have preferred that? Uh, no. In this particular case, we need him talking to Anna in order to fulfill our story. We have no story if he's not explaining this to someone. So we have kind of an excuse for the narration. Mm-hmm. We can go back in time a little bit and explore why he's the man with no past. What's really kind of odd and amazing about retelling this story to Anna is most of the story is about how irresistible uh, Kathy was. Oh, I thought you were going to say what's amazing is the fact that our narrator is actually narrating to somebody instead of just voiceovering the film. Giving it the good old Harrison Ford Blade Runner. Wow, there's something that hasn't been tagged for we a while. We finally meet face to face. I was hoping our audience just forgot that Blade Runner existed, <laughs> and now they're going to remember and start sending us emails. But no, you're right. The fact that he's telling his new girlfriend about this wonderful romantic Alcapulco getaway. a little weird, getaway. right? Yeah. Now, we're both fans of, uh, uh, what's the word, raconteur, I think, is, yeah. is the word sure. I really like for that. I thought you were going to say women, but raconteur is fine, too. Both of those. We like storytelling. Uh-huh. Uh huh. You're, you know, in the in kind of the profession of storytelling yourself. You do a lot of writing. Mm-hmm. I myself am a terrible writer, <laughs> but very much enjoy telling stories. Sure. And uh, and that's probably why we find ourselves podcasting after yep, so yep, many years yep. after such a failed show like The Singing Detective and that other movie with that one guy. So have you ever found yourself in a predicament where you're explaining an awesome story from your past that involves telling your girlfriend? Yeah. How extremely hot some chick was. Yeah, or something like how, that. How does that usually go? <laughs> a lot of times, it, I kind of have to play it by uh, whether or not to use the name. Ah, good. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. If you don't, use, a little ambiguous. If there. you don't use the name, then it feels a little disconnected. You don't have to worry not about a, an obvious time frame. Sure. Or if they don't know the name, then you can use the name, but then maybe you don't have to use girlfriend. Ah, excellent. You know, you kind of have to play your cards based on. Uh, it becomes part of the storytelling for you then? Yeah, well, it becomes part of the challenge. Because the, bi- the biggest point of telling any story, and this is, this is film noir completely included, is that you have to make sure that it is most enjoyable to the target audience. Right. If the target audience is your current girlfriend, part of weaving the best possible story is not infuriating her by sure. telling the story sort of defeats the purpose right at that point you're just talking to yourself yeah this is all starting to remind me of the aristocrats a little bit tailoring <laughs> your tailoring your story if you wanted to hear a big long show about storytelling the aristocrats now despite the romance angle the reason that i really like out of the past is uh is twofold one will be a, a great piece of conversation we could tease a little bit sure and then completely look at the other instead which is jane greer who plays Catherine in here Jane Greer had a you know a small role on Twin Peaks, um, as well as actually the Out of the Past remake. What? Which I think there's was, an Out of the Past remake. There was, yeah. I'm pretty sure it's called Against All Odds. Okay. Uh, it's part of this weird series of mm-hmm. remakes of film noir in the 80s. You know, we just talked about Double Indemnity. It was Double Indemnity that had the weird remake huh. uh, in the 80s as well. A lot of these things got remade between 1981 and 1989 for Very whatever strange, strange reason. I think neo noir was starting to pick up a lot, and so we were, you know, bringing up the uh, the old ones as well. And she plays—I uh, want to say she plays somebody's mom. I haven't actually seen Against All Odds, but she sort of uh, she doesn't reprise her role, but she, um, you know, has a bit of an appearance there. 
Although she's probably wearing a lot less trench coats than she is in Fewer this movie. Fewer trench coats. She stands out in our lineup of femme fatales, <laughs> which is both one of my favorite content pieces, but also my favorite aesthetic pieces from yeah. film noir. In my head, I now have a wrong man-esque lineup of femme fatales. Sure, beautiful. And she is standing out. Is uh, Barbara wearing her George Washington wig in that yeah, lineup? That's, yeah, that's part of it. And so it goes without saying, this being my opinion, that she is one of the most attractive femme fatales. But I think that maybe because she slightly resembles Rose McGowan. I don't get your Rose McGowan thing. I'm not really sure I okay. get my Rose McGowan cool. But I can either. agree that she does kind of resemble Rose McGowan. I would say I that was going to ask you if I was crazy about no, that. No, you're not yeah, crazy. A little bit of that. Thank you for first restoring my credibility now that I said I've enjoyed Rose McGowan for some strange reason. Because people are now on her IMDb page trying to find really great films uh-huh. in there. The answer is Planet Terror. That is. that's Well, that's also the reason, right? Gun yeah. for a leg. So Jane Greer, no gun for a leg. But I would say that... Uh, a big part of uh, what stood out to me, and again, I don't know anything, sure. but there are certainly points in the film where she's holding all the cards. Yeah. She's a little bit stronger. She's a little bit more manipulative. She plays the sides. She double, triple, quadruple, octuple crosses. Right. Uh, back and forth, whether it's between uh, um, Wit, who Kirk Douglas played, or uh, I don't know. I, I think she at some point... Probably double crosses herself a few times. Yeah. The amount of double crosses in this movie really depends on whether you count directly stealing something from someone else, a double cross, or how long you have to pretend to be on their side before Before you know betraying that'll be a double cross. Right. But that's absolutely one of I mean, I cannot think of a more manipulative female lead Mm -hmm. in any of the film noir we've done. Catherine never really seems to be under any man's jurisdiction. Sure. She's in cahoots. With many different characters, but I guess with the exception of Wit, who is kind of a mob boss type and right. as a control freak character, sure. she seems a little bit more docile. But overall, she seems like she's a peer, if not exactly. overshadowing the exactly. other characters. She really doesn't need any of the male leads. Mm-hmm. She really doesn't need anybody in the film. She's a, uh, a completely independent person. Even when she meets Jeffrey... They do their own thing during the day. They go out and they sightsee or whatever. We don't even know what she does. She's just off doing her own thing. And then they share their nights together. They meet at night and they kind of hang out and have little dates, which is far different not only from other noir roles, but even from Anna. I mean, when we see him hanging out with Anna, it's just all the time, always hanging out with Anna. You know, they're spending their days and nights together. If he left, Anna wouldn't fucking know what to do with herself. But in this case, she has her own life, she does her own thing, she's completely independent, and then she just happens to enjoy sharing time with him. It's much more in line with a lot of the male roles we've seen. The other thing, talking about uh, similar to the male roles, is she has just an unknown of a background, as Jeff does. Yeah. When we meet her, we don't fucking know anything about her. And in fact, she's more involved in you know crime and conspiracy in her own past. Sure. Than, uh, than it even seems that Jeff is, at least at this point. And killing in a random $40,000. That she stole or misplaced. Or left. You know, and our cliche of the mysterious man is always the man with no past. But they seem to be paired up with women who would tell us their past if anyone cared enough to even ask them. Right. You know, looking back through a lot of these movies, we don't have the stories on, you know, where these women came from mm-hmm. or what they're doing or what their thing is. Yeah. Just because nobody cares. Nobody wanted to ask them. No one. They're there to play, you know, an underhanded person, an evil villain. They don't actually have a story for their past, which is why, you know, we we don't know it. It's weird to think about all of the actors. And, you know, a lot of times actors will come up with backstories or motivations for their character to help kind of, you know, further inform the role as they're playing it. Right. And I think back to all of these pastless women who have nothing going on written in for them and all the lost stories throughout the history of film of all of these poor actresses who came up with these elaborate backstories for what the woman was doing before the camera started rolling. Right. And it's all been lost because nobody cared. Nobody asked them. <laughs> Whereas Catherine, I have no doubt that if Jeff turned to Catherine and asked about her past, she would kind of laugh it off and try and change the subject. She would probably say something sultry and uh, misleading. Exactly. Or uh, coy. Oh, you mean how she responds to everything else yeah, ever? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, speaking of that noir dialogue, they have kind of an interesting exchange when they first meet. They're in that uh, little Mexican cafe kind of right. place. And, of course, there's the usual dialogue going back and forth that's... It's always to impress the audience, but here it's also, you know, smacks the point across, mm-hmm. too. 
And one of the things that Jeff talks about is saying that, you know, nothing in this world is good unless you can share it. He doesn't seem any point in taking on an adventure alone. And that's something really, uh, it's strangely prolific for where these, the, yeah. the kind of arena these movies usually play in. It's, uh, you know, double feature being hosted by people who have no God and mm-hmm. believe in no afterlife. Right. Heathens, I think we're called. It gets into a question of what is the, the point of life. Storytelling could, of course, be one of those things. Yes, that's definitely a possible answer. But certainly sharing what you want to do with other human beings seems like a very, uh, not even admirable, but uh, just a good idea, probably. Yeah. <laughs> probably goes under the general heading of good idea. Uh-huh. So he has the right angle here. He's the one who's in this for kind of altruistic motives. He just uh-huh. wants to he wants to be with somebody, however right. selfish that might be. Sure. He wants to just hang out and enjoy his time with this woman and share experiences. Yeah. And she wants a fall guy. Oh, is that what's going on? Uh, you know, maybe. Now, Out of the Past is a movie that's, I mean, it's well known for its style. But we talked noir lighting to death, if yep. not on, you know, the, the last show on all the ones previous to it. I mean, the backlighting in this movie is especially gorgeous. They do some interesting things with it, but they're all interesting things we've kind of touched on uh-huh. in one show or another. Definitely check out our episode on The Killing for some yeah, specifics on the, the real sure. high contrast stuff. Instead, we need to address a film noir elephant in the room here. Um, what? <laughs> okay, I, so you sat down and watched the film, and then what happened? I sat down and I watched the film, and I was paying very close attention. Sure. And characters that I recognized continued to do things. And then they were talking about people being dead that I didn't know if I had seen get killed. Sure. And then they would bring in new characters who right. I, I felt like I was supposed to know who they were, but I didn't recognize them. I blame part of this on the era because mm-hmm. I feel like all actors in the 40s, female included, looked like every other actor sure, sure. in the 40s. So I had a really difficult... I, I knew Kurt Douglas. Right. Because yeah. I know Kirk Douglas. Mm-hmm. Other than that, I had a really tough time distinguishing who was who, what role they were playing, how many times they, whose side they were on at any given time. Right. They also had trouble distinguishing that in all fairness. And the biggest issue for me is that toward the end, I kind of understood what was going on, who I was supposed to be rooting for, who I was supposed to be afraid of. Right. But what I did then was try to wind it back up in my head so that I could maybe play it out. Put the pieces back together. Right. Except for the... I had this massive missing chunk where I went, why did this start? You couldn't get all the way back to yeah. the beginning. Yeah, sure. You know, part of this, uh, too, because I'm not going to pretend I've been into film noir forever. I've been into film noir, honestly, about as long as I've been into horror movies. Mm-hmm. Probably about a year longer. But when I try and think of what type of movies did I even watch five years ago, I don't, I don't think I watched movies five years ago. So I'm going to agree with you about all of this, and then people in Zuneland can just start beating themselves in the ears with their music-playing device. This could be something universal. It could be part of the, I don't know, MTV generation sort of thing. We really enjoy short movies, and we we fucking featured Crank and Shoot 'em Up together. So it's possible we have short attention spans, and we just can't comprehend long stories uh, with lots of details. Also possible, we might need one of those little yellow film noir detective notepads to be yeah. writing down the clues and right. the characters. At least character names. Well, and what's funny is that I do actually take notes during right. the movie, so maybe that's that's bullshit. Well, they're just characters that show up and they're and then they get killed, and that's when we find out their name. So the reason I wanted to cover this because normally I just try and mask our confusion here. Mm-hmm is that one of the known core elements of film noir that we've never discussed because of that very reason is that it doesn't make any fucking sense. Yeah. And, you know, I'm joking a little bit, but if you wanted to use a a technical phrase, maybe we'd call it an unnecessarily convoluted plot. Yeah. A convoluted plot is what these things are known for. Sure. When you think about pulp detective novels... Uh, it's kind of even something like, you know, a modern film too, like Kiss, Kiss, Bang, Bang. Right. I've seen that a good handful of times. And every time I watch it, I think, oh yeah, I remember how this works. And then about three fourths of the way through some things happen. And yeah. I'm, I think, well, I don't remember this part. Hold on. Let's backtrack a little it bit. It seems like the trick is always so that your audience never sees it coming. Right. But I feel like somewhere along the line that gets lost to no one can follow what's going on. Sure. But that's a piece of what film noir is. Sure. And so some people love the romance stories. Some people love the low-key lighting. 
Some people love that they can't fucking tell what's going on. Or maybe they can, and they look at it like we looked at Primer. And they're just, they're doing nothing but studying the story the entire time, trying to figure out who's using who, Mm -hmm. where the money went, and see if they can arrive at the ending before everybody else can. Or maybe part of the challenge is just to see if they can piece the thing together 10 minutes after the credits are over. I don't think this has ever been more true than Out of the Past, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of the other uh, movies we've seen on the show, I've watched a bunch of times, Mm -hmm. the film noir stuff. And so I know the plot inside now because I'm uncomfortable coming on the show and talking about a movie if I don't know what happened in right. it. But it's out of the past, I will never get. I just, every time I think I'm going to get it, and there's just too many pieces. There's too many me, crosses. There's too many crosses is exactly what it is. You know, there's a catch at every beat in the story. Each scene is a both a revelation to us and a big open question. Yep. And it's not always an open question that we're going to then go on to discover in the, the scene after that. Plus, and this is, I mean, this is outstanding in making it convoluted, is that the flashbacks um, serve to mix up the story a little bit and make it a little harder, but it also makes it, it basically prevents you from explaining this movie to anyone else. <laughs> That's the biggest thing, because when you start to recite this story, it's like um, you know trying to tell somebody what happened in Memento or there's a couple of these these movies that have had flashback components or something like that that we've tried to discuss a little bit on the show, and I always get caught up in the wording. In how do we describe something that happened chronologically? How do you tell a story that's out of chronological order? Yeah, I mean, how do you recite that story back in chronological order? Mm-hmm. How do you deal with the Attic Expeditions was another great example of that, where stuff just was... I mean, the Attic Expeditions had other plot problems, right? <laughs> Even Jeremy Casting couldn't explain that fucking movie to us. But you sound like a fucking crazy person when you start saying, well, the third thing we see in the movie is this, which is really previous in this chunk. Of, I mean, you might as well just stop explaining at that point because no one will know what you're talking about. So having enough of these here double feature episodes, <laughs> when I watch movies, kind of like talking of a, about a history of violence and wondering, all right, those big crane shots or whatever, what are those used for? I see an element of a genre, and rather than just telling myself, man, I hate being confused, Mm -hmm. I think, well, what is this adding to the genre? Why is this part of the chemical makeup of these films? And, you know, I mean, if tons of people eat this up, then obviously it's not something that's defective about the films. Right. It's just something that I can't get my head around. The other part of this, though, might be that, you know, with the exception of Double Indemnity, this is really the earliest piece of film noir we've ever done. I think, uh, actually, The Postman Always Rings Twice was 1946, mm-hmm. and I think this was 1947. So it could also be that we're bringing uh, pulp detective novels to the silver screen for the first yep. time, and we're just not sure how many plot threads people can handle. <laughs> but also, I've never read the book, and I don't know what I'm talking about. All right, so we got this uh, this website on the uh, that there interwebs. That's www with the dot and then double feature show dot again com. I'm gonna give everybody a lesson in the internet. Throw out your www's. Post them on Craigslist. Stick them on eBay. You do not need those anymore. Get them out of your apartment. They are just cluttering up your URL. Double feature show dot com. Some websites actually do require www. Little <laughs> known fact: those websites are retarded, and you should not visit them. Just click on that URL bar, triple click if you're using Safari, and go ahead and just type that right in, and bam, go to our show, hit that return key. I think it's still called return, right? Return key. Doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. If you want to load up your email, you can go to, say, yahoo.com, gmail.com, hotmail.com. No www necessary, again, unless the website is stupid. Uh, Send us an email about, yeah, I'm really curious about this film noir thing. We could be totally off base here, but film noir historians, we are definitely not. (laughs) Two idiots on the internet without www's in their URLs. We definitely are. That's the first time I've said that phrase, and I think I've said it enough for the rest of my life. Fantastic. So we have more movies next week. We do. We're getting back on that uh, on that that Rocky Asia journey. We're doing uh, Rocky Three and uh, the next installment of the Asian very adventure Asian movie. Yeah, is Kill Bill. And you know what? After that, we're going to do Rocky Four and Kill Bill Two directly after. So we're going to kind of lump these things together so that they sort of make sense. Uh So the next two weeks will be Rocky and Kill Bill for the only time this year. The reasons being that this is, you want to talk about convoluted. We are such fucking hypocrites. After all of that conversation, (laughs) then we force people to watch Rocky and a random Asian movie 
Two of which this year, the next two, are not even Asian. Yeah. One of which, by the way, is kind of a Western. Yeah, that's God true. God damn it. Talk about convoluted. Watch more fucking film. Bye.